talking about understanding the church, which not just a building and its function. The church has a function. I've said, other people have said, there's certain things you ought to find in church. First, you. That wasn't on my list originally, but I kind of like where that come out. The first thing you ought to find in church is you, your family. But then you ought to find unity. You ought to find love. You ought to find protection. You ought to find trust where it's safe. Amen. You ought to find the word in demonstration. You ought to find the gifts of the spirit. You ought to find prayer. You ought to find weeping. You ought to find repentance. You ought to find people being healed. You ought to discover people getting born again. Now, this is not just which, you know, that's not because it's lower on the list. I'm just giving you things. There are certain things you ought to find in the house of God. There are certain sounds you ought to hear in the house of God. Sounds of praise. Sounds of worship. Sounds of weeping. Sounds of intercession. There are certain sounds you ought to find in church. How many knows of certain sounds you find in a nursery? Sure there is. And there's certain sounds you find around teenage boys. There's all kind of, there's all kind of things that, that you find. But the church in particular, <laughs> the church in particular, there ought to be certain sounds you find. You ought to, they ought to be accustomed to us. And uh, so I'm talking about the church, who we are and what it is and our function. And, and how does the church function? Now, I know every church functions different. They have different orders of governments, different orders of officers like deacons and elders and whatever. We're not getting into the order of, of uh, ecclesiastical things, but just in the function of a church. Like what did the early church do? How did it function? And that's what we're looking at. So uh, we talked about after the book of Acts, in the book of Acts chapter 2, after Peter got done preaching, it said many were added to the church, about 3,000. And they continued in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and prayer. So this is what the church began to do as soon as it got born again. Nobody had to go put out bulletins and bribe them to get to church. Angel and I talked about again the other day, you know, uh, by far, dad can testify to it or anybody else. By far, I wasn't perfect. But the truth is, nobody had to come and get me out of bed to go to church. Nobody had to come and persuade me. Nobody had to have something special, some fun night for me to come to church. You know, you have a special meeting and some people, the first thing they ask, is it going to be fun? Does it matter? Does it matter? You're going to have joy in your heart by serving God. Is the preacher going to make us laugh? Is he funny? Well, he, he may get right in your business. I don't know. But the truth is, we get to come to the house of God and get the right antidote that God wants us to have. Amen? Uh, so we're going to talk about, we, we talked about they continued in the apostles' doctrine, and we started talking a little bit about the fellowship side of it. And so since we kind of left off in the middle of that, I think it'd be wise to pick up on it because I think it's worth it, worth it because fellowship is one of our core values. It's one of our core values. And so I think we need to know something about it. Years ago, I did each quarter, you know, each month, I did something about a core value, who we are and core values. And so you need to understand fellowship is a core value. It's not just, we don't value it, it's a core value. Family is not something we value, it's a core value. Discipleship is not something that we value as far as, you know, we want to do it because that's what churches do. Discipleship is a core value. So your core values, this is what, this is the importance of it. All right, missions is not something we do because... It's fun and popular. It's a core value. All right? These things are core to us. So this is part of it. So go back with me tonight, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Yeah. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's uh, read some verses that we read uh, before. 
Uh, I started at verse 4 the last time. But I think I'm just going to start right at the text and just go to verse 9 to redeem a little bit of time back. God is faithful. Now, if we didn't read nothing else right there, that's enough to preach on. God is faithful. You ever got, you ever got to thinking about God is faithful? You know, some people can't allow themselves to think about it. We're going to talk about fellowship, but let me help you. Some people can't, some people can't think about God's faithfulness because they have, they have been through too many failures. And you tie your failures to God. Or your lack of getting out of it, you tie to God. See, it's amazing on how people attach things to God. If something good happens, we don't always think God, a lot of people does. But when something's bad, people like to attach, why God? Why God? It's like the story I tell you, somebody finds a $5 bill and says, it's my lucky day. But then they lose a $10 bill and they say, I wonder why God allowed that to happen. Well, why did God allow you to find that? Five. So it's amazing when some, something good happens, it's easy to accredit to our skill, our abilities, and everything else. But when something bad happens, why God? And because so many people's had witnessed what I call faith failures because they failed to receive, now they're trying to work that into a theology on how, why wasn't God faithful? How did God let me down in this? Well, you know, it's like right now, uh, I was talking with Kenny Gatlin today and, and we were talking about my mother and different things as such and some things that Brother Hagen taught. And the truth is, when we have a complete prayer, we didn't talk about this, but I was going to give you an example. We have a complete prayer line here and we're praying for people. I know what I was praying for tonight for breathing. And I know what people raise their hand for if they had that. And then anybody else could, could receive that, okay? So we don't go through here and ask questions. Now, do you believe, like I gave you the story about me being in that church in Richmond. Do you believe when I lay hands on you tonight uh, that the power of God is going to come into your body and you believe you're going to be healed? We don't go through and ask everybody that. So we're praying and believing God for supernatural power healing power and we're believing that you're going to be healed so when you have the pain and you have the symptom and you walk away and you didn't get it then people start saying i don't know why god's not healing me the truth is do we have time to get everybody completely honest to believe do you really believe that you can receive healing instantly right now or do you believe that you can receive it gradually but you're going to be convinced when you leave here healing is working in my body and we don't always know where people's faith is. And Brother Hagen always says, you'll never get the results you need unless it's a gift of the Spirit, the gifts of healing, the manifestation, the gifts of faith. You never know. I mean, you don't know uh, where people are at until you find out where people really are at. And so people have got to connect their faith in this. I've asked people. Do you, before surgery, here's one. Do you believe that God could heal you without you having a surgery? No, we don't, no, nobody wants to say, no, I can't believe God like that because they think we think they're carnal. But if you find out where people, where they're really at, what they can really believe and put their faith on it, you'll find you'll get more results because now their faith is involved in it. Their faith is involved in it. Their faith is involved in it. Let's take my mother, for example. Can God heal cancer? Yes. Can God fix her desire to eat? Yes. But is her faith there for that? No. So do you know where I got her to connect that? Here's where we're going to connect. At this stage, they say you should have this pain. At this stage, you should be going through this. We're going to agree. We can get our faith together that we're not going to go through that progression. Her heart's set for heaven. All right, so we're now we're going to agree that she's not going to go through that progression. So I called today and checked on her, and uh, I talked to my sister, and my sister said that uh, the hospice nurse called and was checking on her, and uh, she was the hospice nurse was there this week. I think it might have been yesterday or something, 
and uh, was amazed that she hasn't had pain yet. Now, her faith will be tried in this. And she'll have to have strength through this and say, no, I believe God. I'm not going to do it. So she's going to have to keep her faith engaged. So I'm going to continue to keep her encouraged, her faith engaged. So we got to find out where people's faith is so we can connect their faith to the word of God and we can start getting results because up here we're just praying and believing God for the miracle power of God. And the truth is not everybody can believe what you're praying. They believe he's the healer, but they can't really believe that this is really going to happen. Am I making sense? Come on. You have to understand that people can only get it. And so now because people don't receive, now we have trouble with the faithfulness of God. God healed that one, but he didn't heal this one. And now people get upset without saying it. They start having ill feelings towards God when Jesus really paid the price and said it's finished. I don't believe, I don't believe God chooses that I'm not going to heal that one. I'm going to heal this one. That'd be like saying... I'm going to save that one, but I'm not going to save that one. It's my will to, for this one to go to heaven, but it's not my will for that one to go to heaven. That's not our doctrine. He's not willing that any should perish, okay? So God is faithful. By whom, I must read to verse 9 again, God is faithful. By whom you were called into the fellowship of his son. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So we're called into the fellowship of his son. Now, fellowship, as I mentioned the last time, I went back and listened to what I, was, what I preached last week. Fellowship is not always food. Sorry to disappoint you. Stop it. It's not always food. Now, when we say we're going to have fellowship time after church, the first thing somebody's going to think is food because we've tied, we've tied food to fellowship. Men's fellowship. What do you think of? Breakfast. Bacon. Bacon. That's it. Men's fellowship. You think, of, you think of food because fellowship. Now, to me, eating, to me, eating is a part of fellowship. I don't like to eat by myself. I never did. When I traveled on the road, I'd go grab something, go back to the hotel. If I'm going to have to eat by myself, let me do it in a hotel room. I do not like, to me personally, I've done it and have to do it. But for me to go sit at a restaurant by myself to eat, to me, that is one of the most disappointing things there is. F- food ought to be around fellowship. If you're going to have food, you ought to be around fellowship. But fellowship is not always food. You fellowship around prayer you can fellowship around the word of god you can fellowship around there's a lot of things you fellowship when two people get together they can have a pure fellowship one with another but for me i don't like to eat by myself other people say they don't bother them at all uh i i I just don't i enjoy the company of people i enjoy the company of people i'd rather say hey you want to go get breakfast hey let's go have lunch or something because to me it's more than the food i could go through mcdonald's well Maybe not. Uh, uh, You could go to a fast food place and just get food. But there's something about communing during that time is precious to me. That's what it means something to me. And and when you want to fellowship, uh, it takes an effort on both sides. It takes an effort. To sit down with somebody and I got to carry all the conversation, that's, that's, that's heavy. That's not fellowship. That's one person wanting to fellowship, another person existing. To have fellowship in the house of God, you've got to participate. You've got to participate in it. So we have fellowship. It said we are called into the fellowship of his son. So if we're called into the fellowship of his son, that means fellowship has aspects to it. It has love. It has giving. It has sharing. It has unity in it. And so when I hear the word fellowship, another word that comes to me is unity. How can two people walk together unless they agree? Amos chapter 3 says, how can two people walk together unless they agree? So you can't have fellowship and discord. You can't do that. You can have a conversation, but you can't have fellowship. The Bible talks about being with people of like precious faith. Now we can fellowship around the Lord Jesus Christ. 
But some people, I can only go as far as the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't go into the things of the Spirit. I can't go in things of the gifts of the Spirit because we have no commonality in that. But we have fellowship around the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what our fellowship's about. Some churches are called something fellowship churches. Grace fellowship, love fellowship. Because that is what we do. Actually, fellowship is where fellows, brothers come together under the unity and the banner of love. Sharing the same heart, the same love, the same purpose. And chasing the same God with all their heart. That I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. You're not your own. You're bought a price. If I have something, I'm going to help you. You have something, you help me. This is true fellowship. This is the fellowship that we have one with another. Go, go with me to the book of Galatians. The book of Galatians, chapter 2. The book of Galatians, chapter 2. Also, let's just go right to verse 9. I, I realize it didn't happen just in verse 9. Uh, this is dealing with us defending the gospel and different things that happens. Uh, you know, Paul, Paul went ahead and was uh, confronting Peter over some issues. And then in verse 9 it says, And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, pillars, what's, what's pillars? People that are that are strong in the house of God. You know, a pillar. This person's a pillar in the house of God. That means a pillar is somebody, is something that's going to be able to stand up under pressure and do it right. Not, not everybody's a pillar. Just because you're a leader don't make you a pillar. Because pillars is what holds things up. When somebody says they're a pillar to the house of God or a pillar to the man of God, that means that, that uh, the man of God can lean upon them and knowing that they're not going to crumble. And when everything is through, we all stand together. Come on, thank God for pillars in the house of God. Amen. Now, we don't have ancient pillars in here. We have some nice beams. But aren't you glad those beams are there? They hold weight. Pillars did the same thing. People have... Porch pillars. Well, what, what do those pillars do? They're not just decorative. They usually hold weight. They're a support. So they're saying, these people are pillars, man. They are pillars in the house of God. When James and, and Cephas and John, who seem to be pillars, perceive the grace that has been given to me, the grace, the call of God, the anointing, God's hand upon me to do certain things, they gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship the right hand of fellowship that we should go to the Gentiles and, and they to be go to the Gentiles and they to be circumcised. They desired only that we should remember the poor, the very things which I also was eager to do. And that was remember the poor. So they gave to us the right hand of fellowship. So here's what it is. I believe that what God's called you to do is right. And even though we, you know, they really didn't know Paul all that well at this point in time because he didn't spend all that time with them. But they gave him, let me have your hand. They gave him the right hand of fellowship and said, you are now one of us. And you're going to go when you're not only going to represent Jesus Christ, but you can represent us. That is a true fellowship. Do you realize when you're part of this fellowship, you represent each other? That's why I get concerned about carnal people saying that, oh, I'm a part of Covenant of Peace Church. And then they show off in Walmart or something, you know. <laughs> Somebody asked me a long time ago, says, why don't you get, of course, until Ohio changed their law, we had to have a front license plate. But someone said, why, why don't you get license plates and says, Covenant of Peace. I said, uh-uh. <laughs> I know how some of you drive. I don't I don't want to be, that could be bad business, man. Uh-huh. Oh. I know how you drive. No. Guilty by association, isn't it? Now, driving fast is, uh, 
is uh, how you interpret fast. <laughs> Road rage is a different story. My standards, I don't drive fast. Anyway, the right hand of fellowship. So if somebody says, I'm going to give you the left foot of fellowship, what does that mean? Kick to the curb. So Brother Hagin says, you know, I got saved, baptized with the Holy Ghost, and I got the left foot of fellowship amongst the Baptists that come amongst the Pentecostals. So that means that he was in fellowship with that group, and as soon as he got baptized with the Holy Ghost and spoke with other tongue, he got the left foot of fellowship and got the right hand of fellowship amongst the Pentecostals, he said. So fellowship is more than just food. It didn't say they kicked him off from the table and the Pentecost said, come to our table. No, there is a table. There's a table spread in the love of God and the word of God. And we're all able to come and dine at that table. But it's not all natural. It's spiritual food that we have. So we have this fellowship. How can two walk together lest they agree? How many knows a house divided can't stand? A house divided can't stand. It just can't stand. Uh, you have, if the enemy can get people out of fellowship, just because they attend the same thing doesn't mean they're in fellowship together. Doesn't mean they have common goals and common purpose. I, I really believe in my heart in these last days, there's going to have to be pure fellowship. Something that would motivate people and compel them to come to the house of God. You know, for some reason, if somebody would ask me, why don't you think people come to church? Well, I get asked that a lot anyway. Well, why, why do you think people don't want to come to church? Well, number, number one, a lot of people that I know left here, they ain't going anywhere. So a lot of churches, a lot of pastors have people leave. They're, they're, not, they're not going to somewhere else. Now, some people just can only stay so many years. They either wear out their welcome or they just can't stand to be in the same place very long. And probably if you go back and look at the work record, they probably didn't stay at the same job more than five years. They can't stay consistent. Some people are like rotten tape. They can't stick to anything. And so, um, so with that, because uh, you, you have that. But here's why a lot of people don't come. They can blame me. They can blame you. They can blame this or that. But they don't find the church creates a, something to add value to their life. And anything you don't feel adds, vad, adds value to your life, you don't participate in it. You don't participate in it. It's like some people, they can stand there talking to them. I've been guilty, I guess, people say. Look at their watch, whatever, and look over their head. Because the conversation doesn't add value to them. You understand? So they don't connect. So apparently, some people can feel like the church doesn't add value. There's no value added. Is that a true statement? It, it, probably not, because a lot of other people hear the same message, have the same, same opportunities, and they feel values added to them. So fellowship becomes very important to how we perceive and what we do. So it's not just we're going to go to church. If we get the mindset, I get to go fellowship with my brothers and sisters today. I get to go... I get to go take arms with my brothers and sisters today. I'm going to leave in power. The grace of God on my life is going to be increased, and I'm going to be able to go and make a difference in the world because I'm not just going to do something to be there or because i got to work the nursery. No, I'm not just going to go. And this thing only coming when you got a position. Don't work in your life anyway. You got to have value in this. You got to have value in it. I, I, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I mean, this is a, it, I don't like the word, I, I guess because SMTI messed me up with it, but the word volunteer is not always a great word. But this is a volunteer army. Nobody drafted you. But even in America, it's, you're not drafted, you volunteer, but you're still expected to abide by the codes and conduct and be on time, 
tend your post and get it done right. Amen? It's just something good about it. It's something good. It gives you value to know that somebody's depending on me. It shouldn't put you under pressure. It should give you value that somebody depends on you. This is, the, this is the church and its function. I don't know how else to do it. If you're going to preach about the church and its function, it's not just when it's convenient for you because you are a part of us. Now, I realize all of you yous that need to hear this are not here. <laughs> but yous can get Spotify or something and still get it. But the church and its function. You know... We ought to be able to find joy. We sing the song, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Is there really? There should be, shouldn't there? There should be. So this fellowship, fellowship. Let's, uh, Let's end with some of my favorite verses. Go to 1 John. Say, I have fellowship one with another. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Are you there? First John, chapter 1. Now, we all like verse 9, you know, if we confess our sins. But this is, let's just walk through some of these verses. Let's just go... Verse 1 of First John, chapter 1. And a lot of ones there. 1 John, chapter 1, verse 1. That which is from the beginning, and that almost sounds like his gospel, isn't it? In the beginning was the word. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, And our hands have handled concerning the word of life. He's proven that Jesus Christ came in the flesh. We handled him. We saw him. We heard him. He's there. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. This eternal life, Jesus. He was with the Father and he's manifested to us. That's like Gospel John 1.14, that word became flesh and manifested to us. Okay? So that's what he said. That which we have seen, heard, we declare to you that you may have fellowship ooh, with us. Let's look, let's look at that again. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. This is where true fellowship is. Let's talk about the things of God. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's talk about the goodness of God. In these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So when you walk in this kind of fellowship, it brings a joy level in you. It brings a joy level in you. Amen. The fellowship of the saints. Now, I thank God for fellowship along with some food. I'm telling you what, there ain't, there ain't a whole lot more precious than sitting with a brother talking about the things of God over a good cup of coffee. To me, that's just priceless. I like it. Well, that would add value to it. That would add value to it. But just sitting with coffee, just sitting with coffee, just sitting with coffee. Yeah, it just adds value to it. Uh, There's times where Scott just come to the office in there with a cup of coffee. Uh, There's things that we do here. We make sure the thing gets done. It runs right. But just sitting there and talking about what we do here and just sipping a cup of coffee and fellowship, it means a lot. It's not a waste of time. Now, if that's all you do is sit around and drink coffee, it can be a waste of time. But there's something about fellowship over this, okay? There's something about fellowship that brings joy. This is the message that we have heard from him and declared to you, we're in fellowship now together, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. I like that. There's no darkness in him. If we say that we have 
Somebody help me again. You all say it now. If we have what? If, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, where will we lie? And do not practice the truth. So here's the thing. You, you, you can't have fellowship with light and fellowship with darkness at the same time. You, the, the Bible says that out of the same spout, you can't have bitter water and pure coming out of it. So it's going to change somewhere. It's going to change somewhere. And so he says that if we say that we have fellowship with him, if we say we have fellowship with him and continue to walk in darkness, we're lying. No, fellowship is having that common goal, that common purpose, walking in that common truth together and doing it. That doesn't mean we're all perfect in it, but we do it. But if we walk in the light, say walk in the light. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Come on. You know, you don't have to believe everything that I believe and the way I believe it for me to have fellowship with you as long as you don't have to, as long as you don't fight what I believe and we find a common ground on what we do believe, it's perfect. Amen? It's perfect. Uh, I've been with people that come from a Reformed theology, a Calvinist th- theology, and uh, there are certain subjects that we don't, that we don't uh, discuss, but the truth is we all believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. We all believe that he is the Savior, healer, the baptizer, and soon coming king. Amen? Amen. We, we, we believe that. We believe that. Now, on election and and uh, once saved, all we, we just stay away from that. We have fellowship around the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on. We have fellowship around the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not everybody has to believe what you believe. Not everybody has to believe what you believe. But some people get offended if you don't believe what I believe, then get out of my ship. Fellow. Some people, some people row all by themselves because nobody else really fits in their ship. Jesus said, if they're not against us, they're for us. This gets better here. I'm going to go back to verse 7. If we walk in the light, I wonder what does that mean, walk in the light? Walking in him, right? In him we live and move and have our being. Walk in the light. Let's talk about the word. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. So we're walking in him. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. Oh, watch this. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Isn't that amazing how fellowship is tied to getting this forgiveness and cleanness? If we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So, number one, we have fellowship. I'm going to walk in the light as he's in the light. We can have fellowship with one another. And my heart's going to stay right and clean. So, therefore, when I repent, the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse me of all of my sins. You know, there's something about this strife and unforgiveness that's messing people up. I think a lot of people remain sick. They remain sick because they don't forgive. I believe that. I believe Scripture can bear witness to that. Some people remain sick because they don't forgive. Unforgiveness is like a canker. A cancer. Unforgiveness is like a cancer. It's, I mean, it just kind of eats at you. It kind of eats at you. Remember this? We did some months back. I talked about the love of God and that one part about it. I hate my mother-in-law. Remember that story? That Brother Hagin story? I hate my mother-in-law. He says, look at me. And, and when you say that, tell me what happens down there. She says, I hate my mother-in-law. He said, what happened? She says, something's scratching me. He said, it's because the love of God is shed abroad in your heart. But some people just have a hard time forgiving people. They would love, but they just can't forgive. 
Hold grudges. Hold grudges. I'm telling you what, I'm, I'm too tender to hold a grudge. I can hold a lot of things, but a grudge is one I can't hold, man. Uh, matter of fact, the quicker I get that off my plate, the better I am. I don't do it. So Jesus gave parables about people for forgiving one another. Matter of fact, the parable goes on to say because a person that was forgiven of something, he had the ability to pay back. Because the man that he owed money to let him off the hook. He had the ability or that man had no ability to pay it. He had no ability at all to pay it. Matter of fact, the, the amount he paid, he could have worked a lifetime and not paid it off. And the man that he owed it to said, it's free, clear. And then he went right out and took a brother by the throat that owed him something that he had the ability to pay if he'd give him time and said, pay me. It wasn't like he did it. He had no ability to pay. It's like they wrote a song and said, I owed a debt I couldn't pay. He paid a debt he didn't owe. So we, we owed a debt that we could not pay in sin. But Jesus Christ paid that debt for us. And God and that man forgave him. And he went right out and took a guy by the throat and said, pay me. And then if you don't, I, he put him in jail. And the good man that forgave the guy that had no way to pay heard about it and called him to the carpet. Is this thing I heard true? That a guy's in jail because you wouldn't forgive him the way I forgave you? And you know what it goes on to say? That he was turned over to the tormentors. I believe with everything in me, unforgiveness will bring torment into your life. You open the door to torments. I don't want to be tormented with anything. Amen? To me, I don't like torment at all. So I don't want to be turned over to any form of tormentors. What I want is true fellowship. I want true fellowship one with another. I want true fellowship. I want to walk in the light as he's in the light. So just keep walking in the light. Remember the story I talked about? When you walk in the light, you, you, you don't trip over things because it's not, it's because things that are hidden and dark, that's where you trip. But when you walk in the light, it's he's in the light. I was visiting the church with um, Brother Wayne White when he was pastor and his brother Roger, who came to the missions conference this past year. He wanted to show me, you know, where he went to church at. And uh, they had this great big fellowship hall area. And we were on the other side of it. But the lights, the lights, you know, you had to walk over there to get the lights on. You walked in one room and there's chairs everywhere. And, you know, you're hitting, bumping things going over there. And, and uh, so we turned the light on and everything was clear. I didn't bump in anything when the lights were on. But then when he turned the lights back off, we had to walk back across it. But the door we came in at is like... Two double doors had enough light right in the middle of it. Had no problem seeing that door because that little bit of light guided us. See, when you walk in the light, it keeps you from being tripped up, caught into snares and traps. So walk in the light as he's in the light and we can have fellowship one with another. So our fellowship is around the word of God. Tonight, we're fellowshipping around the word of God. And I realize we don't have a chance for you to raise your hand and, and uh, share what's on your heart. But I guarantee you, all of you have a story that you could share because that's what it's about. That's what makes small groups so good. Because people can fellowship and share something that God shows them on their heart. The bigger the crowd, the less you're able to do that. Some churches can't even have the gifts of the spirit. If somebody gave a tongue... Nobody would ever know it because it's too large. Church this size still, still lends us to be able to have a tongue and interpretation. Some sanctuaries can be so big you can't do it. And people say, we, don't, we never have tongues and interpretation. Well, that's maybe because if somebody yells out in the back, they don't know if you're praying in tongues or whatever because there's just no way to hear. There's just no way to hear. So you'll have more of a prophetic thing, thus saith the Lord, you know, without the tongue, because tongues and interpretation still equals the same thing. So there's certain things you can't have. A couple of weeks ago, someone was here and uh, visited us, and we had two tongues, two interpretations. Uh, that was a 
a week ago Sunday or something. And, uh, and so when that, the, the night of the baptism, we had that. And I had guests here. And I was talking with them. And this is what they said. It's been years since we've been in a place where there was tongues and interpretation. There was something that just touched their heart. So if you've got a large congregation, you can't do that. Because somebody, somebody could just do it and nobody would ever hear it. And it's not that you're trying to ignore it. It's just you don't hear it. But that's why the pastor may be getting up. You take somebody like Pastor Barkley, his sanctuary. Nobody would maybe hear that. That's why he'll get up a lot of times would, during song service say, uh, thus saith the Lord. Well, uh, he can just go to that sequel the same thing. That may have been here. Somebody may have given a tongue and we did it in interpretation. It's all part. But it's about the fellowship we have together. We come with a purpose. We come to add value. When you come, you bring your faith. You bring your heart. And we're not concerned about so much about what I get is what I can be a part of. What I can be a part of. And that's what's, that's what's important, you know. I just don't get anything. Well, give something. Pray for the person in front of you, beside you, besides your husband. God, you got to fix him. I mean, you you, you got to pray for you got to pray for people, and believe God for them. Amen. All right. So we have fellowship one with another, and if we do that, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all of our sin. It's precious. All right. Well, let's stand together.